Hello everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Urine Toxicology Testing and Support of Pain Management, presented by Dr. Jennifer M. Colby. We're excited to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. I'm Christina Jewell of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the question, during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located on the lower left of the presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Please notice that you will also be viewing this presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located in the lower right. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window or use the Q&A button to let us know you're having a problem. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credits. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Jennifer M. Colby. Dr. Colby is an assistant professor in the Department of Pathology, Microbiology, and Immunology, and the Medical Director of Toxicology and Esoteric Chemistry at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Jennifer earned her BS in Molecular and Cellular Biology from Vanderbilt University in 2007, and her PhD in Molecular Toxicology from the University of California, Berkeley in 2012. She completed her postdoctoral training in clinical chemistry and toxicology at the University of California, San Francisco in 2015. She is a member of SOF SOFT, MATT, AACC, ACLPS, AACT, and IATDNCT. Her research interests include developing new applications for mass spectrometry in toxicology and laboratory medicine. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jennifer Colby. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Dr. Colby? Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks, Christy, for that introduction. And thank you to LabRoots for giving me the opportunity to talk today about a topic that I find particularly interesting which is using urine toxicology in support of pain management. I have nothing to disclose. Um, I, I am, of course, an employee of Vanderbilt University Medical Center, and anything I'm about to say is you know, my, my personal opinion and not that of my employer. So, um, I believe we have a poll coming out. Perfect. Um, I'm, I'm interested to get a sense for um, where the audience is. What, what, what brings you to this webinar? Why are you interested in, in pain management and toxicology testing? So, I mean, I could imagine that physicians would be interested, um, also laboratorians, because of course we are responsible for providing and occasionally interpreting um, the results that are used to help pain management providers determine whether or not um, a patient is using their medications appropriately. So we'll just um, let this poll sort of hang out um, while we talk about why we should care about pain management. And one of the reasons that pain management has become such an important topic is because of chronic pain. So chronic pain is any sort of pain that extends beyond the expected period of healing, which is around six months. So something that um, is short, acute, like say um, a uh, oral surgery um, that results in you know, a weak course of painkillers. Okay, so it looks like everybody here is um, laboratorians um, and the majority of us are doing toxicology testing. Um, so that's interesting, that will, that will help me um, as we go forward. So thank you for participating. So chronic pain, um, uh, greater than six months. So it's, it's different than um, just a short, like week-long course of medication. Um, chronic pain is a huge problem. There was a recent study that estimated about 25 million Americans suffer from chronic pain. And that's 
around one in 10, uh, something like 11% of people. So this is a very prevalent concern. And chronic pain can take a variety of forms. There's arthritis, back pain, there's cancer pain, which is sometimes considered a sort of special subtype of chronic pain, um, migraines, myalgias. So it runs the gamut. There's a lot of different, um, there's a lot of different um, clinical considerations that all fall under the umbrella of chronic pain. One of the drugs that we care a lot about when considering chronic pain are opioids. And opioids are a large group of analgesics, so they provide pain relief. And there's two main types. So opioids is the larger category. You could think of that as the big umbrella. And within that category, there's another group called opiates. Um, and opiates are naturally occurring compounds. So typically that's codeine and morphine. Whereas opioids can be um, derivatives of those, so semi-synthetic drugs like oxycodone, or they could be completely synthetic drugs like fentanyl. And the distinction between opiates and opioids will become more important later on when we talk about how screening tests for these drugs work. But one of the types of treatments used in chronic pain are opioid analgesics. Chronic pain is a big concern here. We've just talked about that. And one problem that's been associated with the increase in use of um, opioids for chronic pain is just the number of pres prescriptions that are given out. So this map shows data from the year 2012, which is the last year that we have a complete data set. And this is, map is colored by the opioid prescriptions per 100 people. And the lighter colored states have lower rates and the darker colored states have higher rates. And what you will see is the states that are in the darkest gray have a rate greater than 100 prescriptions per 100 people. So there's more than one opioid prescription per person in essentially um, the entire Southeast. So we have a lot of these drugs being prescribed. And not surprisingly, um, because opioids are, are very addictive drugs, um, as the number of prescriptions have gone up, so have the um, number of negative consequences. So this graph is showing data for um, deaths due to opioid prescription overdoses, starting from the year 2001 and going through 2014. And the number of deaths, and this is in the entire country, um, ha have gone up. And so opioid abuse or misuse of prescription opioids has become a major concern and has led to um, an effort by um, all people involved in either diagnosing or treating pain conditions, um, led, to, led to an effort to curb the overprescription of opioids. So patients that are um, given opioids for chronic pain are often seen by specialized pain management providers. And there are a number of different clinical practice guidelines that a pain management doctor might use to um, help manage a patient who's being given opioids chronically. Um, a number of different practices have them. And there are, of course, non-pharmacologic treatments that can be used with chronic pain. And so these specialized pain management providers are familiar with these um, sorts of like group therapy type sessions or other non-medication non treatments. But one of the unique things about a pain management practice is that patients are typically required to sign some sort of pain contract, which is a document that stipulates um, how the patient and the provider will handle a number of aspects of that patient's care. And so this can be things like when and how drugs are dispensed. So you have to pick them up at a particular pharmacy. Um, patients are encouraged to send all their medications to one pharmacy to make it easier to ensure that they're not getting prescriptions from multiple providers. Um, how many drugs are dispensed at a time, um, transfer of information. So if the patient sees a new doctor for some other unrelated condition or if another painful condition um, should be diagnosed, you know, you let your pain management provider know about that. And then instructions for return to care. So there's a lot of follow-up appointments involved in this because when you're giving someone a very addictive drug long-term, you wanna make sure that they're using it appropriately and, and not developing um, any sort of aberrant behavior. 
And so there's often monthly follow-up appointments, even in a pain management program, to make sure that people are getting their pain treated adequately and also not um, developing an addiction. So one of the things that's important as part of that pain contract is confirming that a patient is compliant with the drugs that they're being prescribed um, and that they're not using any drugs that the doctor is not aware of. And one of the most common ways to check that is to ask the patient, what are you taking? Or, you know, are you taking what I'm prescribing you? And that can work in some circumstances, but it's typically not adequate for long-term opioid treatment. So um, there are situations in which people are not entirely forthcoming about whether they have or have not been using their medication as it's prescribed. And that doesn't mean that they're um, doing anything terrible. It, it might mean that they're using it more frequently than they're supposed to because it's not controlling their pain or something like that. So a number of those clinical practice guidelines that I mentioned earlier um, recommend that providers who are treating people with opioids for chronic pain use some objective measure of medication compliance. And that can be something like a pill count um, where I've prescribed you um, oxycodone, you're supposed to take it three times a day, which means that for a month you need 90 pills and you're 15 days through the month, so I'm gonna count your pills and you should have 45, something like that. Um, interviews with family. So if a patient is not using their medication appropriately, then often the family will have taken note of that. Um, there's also prescription drug monitoring data. So some states have um, digital records where anybody who's prescribed a substance like opioids that has the potential to be misused goes in a database and the state tracks that. And so if a patient is filling a prescription given by one doctor at one pharmacy and then filling something given by another doctor at a different pharmacy, um, then that information can all be reconciled. So Tennessee does have one of those. So our pain management providers will often check that database before they give a new prescription. And then the final objective evidence, which is, of course, the reason that we're all here today, is urine drug testing, or urine toxicology. So all of this evidence can be used together um, it, to help a provider um, initiate a conversation with a patient, either to say, hey, I think you might not be doing what you say you're doing, or you know, maybe we need to reevaluate what you're being given. Um, so all of this evidence can be um, used together, this cohesive picture of how a patient's doing. So since we're here to talk about urine toxicology, um, we should talk about how we detect drugs in urine. And one of the most challenging things about drug screening in urine is that the ability to detect the drug depends on a lot of different things. Um, so the table that I'm showing you, oh, and my table's a wee bit cut off there, so I apologize for that. Um, but um, what I'm showing you in this table is the average or approximate length of time that you can detect any of these drug classes in urine. Um, and then what you'll see is some drugs are gone pretty quickly, so let's say opioids, um, a few days. Whereas other drugs like long-acting barbiturates could hang around for a couple of weeks. So it really depends on the drug. And part of the um, window of detection and what influences that is the cutoff of the test. So if you're using a very sensitive test, you might have a longer window of detection. The dose of the drug, um, the time since the person last used the drug, whether or not they're a chronic user or if they just use occasionally, um, their metabolism. So I mean, some of this is genetic. There are some people who will metabolize things much quicker. Um, there are some people who are slow. So um, all of that plays into our ability to detect drugs in urine. And so this is obviously not a complete list of things that could imp impact our ability to detect drug, but it's, um, I think it captures a lot of the important variables that we think about when we're interpreting urine drug tests. So one of the things that could be important, um, and some of the practice guidelines for laboratory medicine have recommended um, that labs offer this, but is validity testing. So, um, Anybody who is being monitored for compliance and who is not compliant um, and knows that there are consequences for the lack of compliance may feel like either getting a sample of urine from another person um, who either is using similar medications or who is not using any drugs or adulterating their sample 
um, will allow them to pass the test or otherwise not get a failure. So validity testing is one thing that labs can do to try and help ensure that the samples that are submitted for urine drug testing are valid urine samples. So there's a number of different tests that one can do. Um, you can measure the pH of the sample. A lot of labs will measure creatinine. So as you might imagine, um, if you dilute a sample down far enough, you might get a negative screening result. And even though drugs there, if it's below that cutoff, then you might get a negative. So that would be a way to dilute out a drug um, that you're not supposed to be using. So specific gravity will measure a very similar thing, measure the concentration of the sample. Um, and one final way to beat the test um, is to add a chemical agents, so oxidizing agents or dish soap or um, anything that will interfere with the ability of the screening test to report a result. So there's a couple of different formats. There's real simple dipsticks, um, you test each sample individually, and there's also automated assays for things like creatinine. So it sort of depends on the lab and, and what their procedure is. But um, for something where you're trying to measure compliance in a population of people who might be or are at risk for misusing drugs, um, validity testing is something that might be useful. So assuming we have a valid sample, what's the first thing we do when it comes in the lab? Um, typically, labs will start drug testing with a screen. And generally, um, probably the majority of labs will use a class-based screen. And so this is an immunoassay. So the test is based on an antibody that's targeted towards a class of drugs. And in this case, we expect there to be some cross-reactivity with other drugs in that class. Um, you can imagine they all sort of bind the same receptor. So in some sense, they look alike or they have some structural similarity. And so that antibody um, sort of uh, bind to all of them with some degree of affinity. So it's typically not equal. So um, for example, most opiate immunoassays are targeted against morphine. So they bind morphine with a defined um, sensitivity. But other drugs like codeine or hydromorphone are picked up with varying degrees of sensitivity. So um, class-based assays are one common way to start. And the way that these work is the antibody measures drug and produces some measurable signal. And the result is positive if the concentration of the drug, drug detected is above some predefined cutoff. And those cutoffs are specific to the lab or to the indication. So for example, the cutoffs used for workplace drug testing um, or federally mandated um, probation testing, something like that. Um, those cutoffs are typically much higher. Um, they're meant to detect high-level chronic drug abuse, whereas tests that you might want to do for a pain management population that are, you know, you're expecting people to be compliant the majority of the time, um, and you would expect lower amounts of drug on average, um, you might have a lower cutoff. Otherwise, you might be calling people negative, um, even though drug is present, if it's below your cutoff. So the advantages of these tests is that they're fast. Um, we can do them on automated platforms. So they're relatively cheap. Um, it's not as labor intensive. The downside is that they're not very specific. So they're class-based, um, which means that they are designed and we expect them to bind a number of different drugs. The problem is they don't always bind what they, we think they're binding. So a lot of um, immunoassays will bind some things that you don't expect them to. And so you might get a positive result that doesn't actually indicate that there's an abused drug there. It might indicate some other um, prescribed medication that's, that's not problematic. So it's really important when using a screen like this that we do confirmatory testing. Uh, so details about um, the opiate and the opioid. So remembering back to our two categories. Opiates are a small category within the big category of opioids. So most opiate immunoassays are targeted towards morphine and other drugs will show varying degrees of cross-reactivity. So what I'm showing you here is the cross-reactivity table for the assay for opiates that my laboratory uses. Um, and this is an Abbott Architect assay and the majority of um, automated platforms will have similar cross-reactivities. 
So the cutoff for this test is 300, and so morphine cross-reacts at 300, which you see is a lot of these other drugs cross-react, um, but take a much higher concentration in order to produce a positive result. So what you'll see, or what you won't see rather, is any of the truly um, synthetic opioids. So fentanyl is not on that list. So if a person is being prescribed fentanyl, um, we would not expect them to have a positive opiate result. We would require a special fentanyl immunoassay or another type of screening technique in order to determine that the person had actually ingested fentanyl. So it's important to think about the distinction between opiate and opioid and to consider that that class-based immunoassay is not going to pick up every single opioid that we might care to see. So what do we do when we get a positive screen? Um, well, we confirm that um, with a more specific technique. And so many laboratories will use mass spectrometry for this. And mass spectrometry, um, we could have a whole webinar on how that works and, and the use of that in pain management and in other toxicology applications. But um, I think the most important thing for this particular talk is just to know that it's both more sensitive and more specific than an immunoassay screen. So oftentimes, positive results from immunoassays will be referred to as presumptive positive, as in the screen says there's something there, but we don't really know what it is yet. Um, whereas the result from a mass spectrometer um, will tell us the specific drugs that were present. So if we have a presumptive positive for opiates, and then that goes to confirmatory testing, that would tell us what the particular opiate was. So it will say morphine present or hydromorphone. So confirmatory testing is speciates the drug. And the confirmatory results can be reported either qualitatively, so um, morphine present, or quantitatively. So morphine was present at 327 nanograms per mil. And the distinction or the importance of that number um, varies. So sometimes using ratios of different metabolites can help you to determine whether or not a patient took multiple drugs. Um, Sometimes those numbers just add to the confusion because so many different things impact the concentration of drug in urine. You recall that table from a few slides ago. So um, that's sort of up to the laboratory, uh, how they report those values. And I do want to just say that um, the mechanism I presented here where you have immunoassay screen followed by confirmatory testing is um, fairly standard, but a lot of laboratories who are doing pain management testing are moving towards something called a definitive screen. So that means they're going to skip that immunoassay and they're going to go straight to mass spectrometry. Um, and the advantage of that is you only have to do one set of testing and you can measure a whole number of different drugs. Because there's a lot of drugs on our list of things that might be important for pain management that are not available um, with an immunoassay screen. So in that case, you, you, you have to test some other way anyway. So definitive screening is, is something that's coming, and a lot of the laboratory guidelines are um, recommending this as a good approach for pain management. So um, what's so tricky about interpretation? OK, uh, our second poll. So the purpose of this poll is to get a sense for how many people um, typically are doing interpretations, because um, the rest of the talk is basically going to be about interpreting the results and, and why it's so challenging. So given that the majority of us are um, laboratorians and look like about half of us are people who are performing drug testing, I'm going to guess that um, probably half of the people will have interpreted um, urine toxicology results or have some experience doing that. But um, I'm always curious to know. How, how much experience everyone has before we start this part of the talk. I'll just give you a few more seconds to answer.
Well, we here's our results. Okay, so we have a pretty even split. Um, some people, the lab interprets, um, lab always interprets, or the lab interprets by results. So in our particular situation, um, the interpretations are usually done by an attending, so a clinical chemist or toxicologist, um, but we do them uh, by request. We don't interpret every drug screen that we do because we do a lot of them. So for interpretations, um, one of the things that makes uh, pain management testing and um, urine toxicology so challenging is that a lot of these opioids are interconverted um, by metabolism. So what this figure is showing is a number of drugs that you might recognize, and the arrows indicate um, metabolic steps in the liver that will convert one drug into another. So the green circles that just popped up uh, are highlighting drugs that are available by prescription. So when you see uh, morphine and hydromorphone, that could be because morphine was ingested and was metabolically converted to hydromorphone, or it could be because the patient ingested morphine and hydromorphone, or it could be because the patient ingested heroin and hydromorphone, or just heroin with morphine that was converted to hydromorphone. So there's a number of different um, scenarios that one might imagine um, that are all reflected by a single set of results qualitative results anyway. So the inner conversion here is part of what makes interpreting results so challenging. So I thought we'd walk through a few of the different metabolic pathways because I think there's some interesting points. So starting with codeine. Um, codeine doesn't have a whole lot of analgesic effect on its own, but it's converted by a very polymorphic enzyme called cytochrome um, 2D6. And um, CYP2D6 will convert codeine to morphine, and morphine is very potent analgesic. Of course, both codeine and morphine are available uh, by prescription. Now, codeine is also metabolized to hydrocodone, which is another uh, drug that's available by prescription. And so often if somebody has taken codeine, you could see codeine and morphine, or you could see codeine, morphine, and hydrocodone in the urine. Um, and depending on whether or not your laboratory tests for um, nor codeine, you may or may not see that. So that's another thing that varies between laboratories. Some will test for all the metabolites, some will only test for certain metabolites. Um, so the test menu is entirely up to the laboratory. So looking at morphine, I mentioned that codeine can produce morphine. You can get morphine um, just as a drug by itself. So um, morphine is metabolized um, in a phase two reaction by glucuronal transferase enzymes. Um, so that's what you see on the screen with UGT2. So um, morphine is makes two glucuron metabolites, morphine 3, um, which is inactive, and morphine 6, which is an active metabolite. So some laboratories will um, speciate morphine and morphine glucuronide in their confirmatory testing. Um, some laboratories will not do that. Some will just cut the glucuronides off and measure total morphine. So Again, it depends on laboratory policy, what you do. But another thing to think about when you're um, using an immunoassay screen is that in urine, a lot of these drugs will have glucuronide conjugates or other conjugates um, as part of metabolism. And so those screens don't always have defined cross-reactivity with the glucuronide metabolites, or the cross-reactivity with the metabolite might be significantly less than with the unconjugated drug itself. So that can also lead to differences in the ability of a screen to detect a drug. Um, and the other uh, metabolic product of morphine is hydromorphone, as we mentioned, which is an active metabolite that is um, typically a very small fraction of the morphine dose is converted to hydromorphone, um, but hydromorphone is also, also available by prescription. So I mentioned previously that having quantitative results can sometimes come in handy um, in order to determine whether or not something is present as a metabolite of some other drug, or whether it's present because uh, the person took two separate substances. So one thing that can be really useful is looking at the ratio of codeine and morphine. So you can get codeine and morphine um, from several different scenarios. Um, the three common ones are either taking codeine, where it's converted to morphine, um, using morphine, and we'll talk about where that comes from in just a second, 
um, or using heroin. So using the ratio of codeine and morphine can help you to distinguish between those three possibilities. So if codeine is used, usually the ratio of codeine to morphine is much higher. Um, whereas if, if morphine, the substance itself, like the drug morphine is taken, um, you can sometimes see a very small amount of codeine present as an impurity in the actual pill. And so in these cases, we would expect the ratio of codeine to morphine to be much less than one. So it's typically a very small ratio. Now, heroin contains um, acetylcholine as an impurity. And so when that acetylcholine is metabolized, you will often see codeine present. And so in the case of heroin use, you might see um, morphine and codeine, and the ratio would be uh, ratio of codeine to morphine would be somewhere between one and ten, um, less than one to ten. So not um, not a ton. So ratios can be useful. Um, going back to oxycodone. So oxycodone is one of the semi-synthetic opioids, and it's metabolized to oxymorphone. Again, a drug that's available by prescription. So um, again, the enzymes that are responsible for these met metabolic steps are polymorphic, and so some people will produce more of one metabolite than other people. But both uh, oxycodone and oxymorphone are active, and typically people who are testing for oxycodone will use a special immunoassay screen designed specifically for oxycodone and oxymorphone because these don't cross-react very well with the traditional opiate immunoassay. In, in a very similar vein, hydrocodone is metabolized to hydromorphone, and both of those drugs are available by prescription. So again, this is a situation in which um, hydrocodone makes hydromorphone. Um, you can also get dihydrocodine, which is another drug that's available by prescription, although it's not used as commonly um, as hydrocodone. So in a patient who's taking hydrocodone, you could see hydrocodone, hydrocodone, hydromorphone, hydrocodone, hydromorphone, and dihydrocodine. And then depending on whether or not your laboratory tests for it, um, the other metabolite of hydrocodone is norhydrocodone. Um, our laboratory doesn't confirm that one, but some laboratories might. So again, there's lots of potential explanations for um, a particular pattern of drugs absorbed in heroin. Now I mentioned this for morphine, that morphine pills can contain a small amount of codeine. So we said that those are um, opiates. They are they come from a natural source, and so as part of the purification process, even though the drug company is selling you morphine, there might be just you know a very small percentage of codeine present. And so these are allowable limits for impurities in a number of different drugs, um, and the typically observed amounts, I mean, you can see they're very, very small. So if this is the source of a positive result in a urine sample, then you would expect to see very, very low amounts of whatever the impurity is and very, very high amounts of whatever the active ingredient is. So if the patient is prescribed oxycodone and they're on high doses several times a day and they've been using it chronically, then you might see a very small amount of hydrocodone present in their urine sample, and it could be due to the pharmaceutical contamination. So this is always something that we think about when we're doing interpretations, um, because as you might imagine, the other reason to have hydrocodone in your urine is because you've used hydrocodone. So there are a number of limitations to urine toxicology testing. Um, it is not a source of truth um, unless you recognize the downfalls. So a lot of the screening tests are designed for overdoses. So these are those class-based immunoassays. They're not designed for monitoring compliance in pain patients. And so what that means is if um, someone is on a low dose of drug or they're on drug as needed and they haven't been using it frequently or they didn't take the dose the day or two before their um, drug screen, then they might screen negative even though they're not misusing the drug. So false negatives can happen in a pain management um, type of situation because the screening test cutoff is not designed for that indication. And that's one reason that people are moving towards the definitive screen the mass spectrometry based screen um, for, for pain management. Or another limitation is trying to use a urine drug screening result um, to determine whether or not a person is compliant with their dose and what, what the time of the last dose was. We talked about all the factors that influence whether or not we can detect drug in urine. And there are a number of 
different strategies that people have tried to normalize concentration of drug in urine, either to creatinine, to creatinine and a whole bunch of other um, physiological parameters, like body size, um, mean body mass, all that sort of thing. Um, but this is really tricky to do. So um, the National Academy of Clinical Biochemistry um, is, has a draft guideline right now um, for monitoring pain management therapy. Um, and they recommend that uh, using urine results to determine compliance with a dosing regimen, as in, has my patient actually taken this drug three times a day like I prescribed him? Um, it's, it's not a best practice. So sometimes providers want that information. And if they want that information, I think generally the better um, resource for them is to order blood toxicology, where the pharmacokinetics are much more um, understood, plus inter-individual variability. And then I think the last point to make is that um, we've just discussed all the different ways that we can see some opioids in urine. And the interpretations are not always straightforward. And um, sometimes, as an interpreter, um, this happens to me a lot, I'm sure, for those of you who do interpretations, you're familiar with this too. There are several explanations that could explain the results, and I can't um, tell the doctor which one is the most likely. So a lot of the time, it still ends up that the physician has to decide which interpretation makes the most sense um, based on their suspicion or their interaction with the patient. So in spite of all that we do to try and make this process easy and to simplify the interpretations, they can still be confusing, um, and it's just sort of a root fact of, of how this works. So when we do interpretations, what do we think about? Um, we think about the concentration of the drug in urine, if you have that information. Um, and we know that that depends on a number of different things, but if you have concentrations, you consider what those are. Is the concentration really high? Um, is that consistent with um, what this patient is saying, or is that consistent with the doctor's question? You look at metabolite ratios, and those can be affected by a number of things. So a lot of drugs will alter the metabolic enzyme activity, and so they will speed them up or they'll turn them off, and that will all alter the expected ratios of metabolites that you might see. Consider the dose of drug. Um, if you know that person's inborn um, or their genetic status, like are they inherently a poor metabolizer with a certain enzyme? If so, then you might expect a different pattern of metabolites. And then if you know the time of the last dose, then you can um, think about whether or not that makes sense with what you're seeing. So if the patient said they haven't taken the drug for a week and you still see it in their urine, does that make sense? Um, and then analytical factors. Um, so there's a lot of things to consider, you know, the details of your assay and, and what you know about false positives or false negatives or interfering substances. Um, always think about carryover from previous samples and confirmatory testing. If you have a really high sample, are you sure that the trace amount in the subsequent sample is actually present and not due to contamination? And then um, something that also could be in something to consider is whether or not you're actually testing the right sample from the right person. Was there a mix-up, either intentional by the patient, where something was substituted, or inadvertent, um, either while the sample is collected or at the laboratory where you know labels got swapped or something? So, lots of things to consider that might explain a discrepant result. So, I thought we'd spend the next little while um, going through some examples. So, our first test case: um, we have a 36-year-old woman who's being treated for chronic lower back pain. And she is prescribed three milligrams of morphine extended release uh, three times a day and 15 milligram oxycodone tablets for breakthrough pain. Um, and she's reported to her doctor that she's taking three or four of these each day. Okay, so we're going to go through the results um, from the screen and from the confirmatory testing, and then a poll will pop up. And so I thought we would um, have fun and, and see whether we agree on the interpretations. So the screening results from this patient's urine sample, um, presumptive positive for opiates and presumptive positive for oxycodone. So the sample was sent to confirmatory testing and it was confirmed positive for dihydrocodone, hydrocodone, oxycodone, oxymorphone, 
morphine, and hydromorphone. So I will tell you right now that um, we actually don't report concentrations. Um, we report results qualitatively, but internally in the laboratory we keep the concentration information so that when we do interpretations, we can go back and reference it and, and use it when we need it. But I think for the majority of our clinicians, um, having all the concentration information would be overwhelming and wouldn't, wouldn't mean a whole lot to them. So just something to think about. So the question that we had about this case was, does the presence of hydrocodone and dihydrocodone indicate that the patient took something bes besides the morphine and oxycodone that she was prescribed? So I'll give you guys a few more seconds to fill out the poll. What's your interpretation? Is this consistent? Um, could it possibly be consistent? Can you think of explanations in which it would be consistent? Um, or can you say definitively, this is not consistent, she's definitely taking something else? Or do you feel like there's just not enough information given to decide based on what I've shown you? Just a few more seconds. Okay. Let's see what everybody said. Okay. So some people think there's not enough information. Um, you know, it's always nice to have more information. And I'd be curious, those of you who said there's not enough, um, if, if, you, if there's a particular piece of information that you would have wanted to know, I'm curious what it is. Um, but the majority of people who responded said that they think the results might be consistent. Um, and I agree. So the way that we wrote this interpretation was that um, morphine can be metabolized to hydromorphone, and oxycodone is metabolized to oxymorphone, so that explains the presence of those four. Um, hydrocodone can be present um, uh, in oxycodone, right, as a pharmaceutical contaminant. So if you recall back a few slides to that table, um, hydrocodone can be found in oxycodone, so that could explain the presence of hydrocodone. And hydrocodone is um, metabolized hydromorphone, so again, um, could contribute to the presence of hydromorphone, and hydrocodone is metabolized to dihydrocodone. So I think the critical statement here is that this pattern of um, Drug, drug positivity in the urine can be seen with patients prescribed morphine and oxycodone, so it might be consistent, um, but we can't rule out additional ingestion of hydrocodone. So often when um, there's a, this is one of those ones where it would go back to the doctor, right? So the doctor has to decide based on this information, um, do I think the patient is using hydrocodone or am I fairly comfortable that um, it's, it's a function of metabolism of the two drugs I'm prescribing. So not always clear cut. Okay, our second case. So this case is a 62 year old man who has a history of non small cell lung cancer and he is being seen by pain management for cancer related pain. So this is sometimes a little bit different because drugs, some drugs that are used in cancer pain are not used very frequently in other indications. So fentanyl is one of those that we see very commonly in cancer pain, but not so frequently in non-cancer pain. This particular patient is prescribed oxycodone. Um, he's on immediate release formulation, and he's on it as needed. So his screening results, opiates were presumptive positives, oxycodone also presumptive positive. He's confirmed positive for hydrocodone, oxycodone, and oxymorphone, and the relative concentrations are shown. And the question um, that the pain management provider has was, does, does the presence of hydrocodone indicate that he's using hydrocodone? Very similar to our previous case as far as the question, uh, but a little bit different as far as the relative concentrations. So I'm curious what interpretation um, everybody would have gotten us on this particular one. I'll give you another few seconds to decide. Okay. 
Okay. Okay, so not so many people are um, on the fence about this one. So just over half said consistent with oxycodone, um, and then results may be consistent with the other the other half. Okay, so um, what we said about this particular one is that pharmaceutical preparations can contain small amounts of hydrocodone as an impurity in the oxycodone, and that the relative ratio is fairly consistent with an impurity as the source of hydrocodone. So. Um, in this particular case, we did come down on the side of it's probably not using hydrocodone. It's probably just the oxycodone. Um, but again, you know, this goes back to the provider, and they they are the ones who interact with the patient and um, make the real determination about whether or not this is compliant. But in this particular case, um, the hydrocodone was so small, um, such a low concentration relative to the high concentration of oxycodone, that we felt fairly confident saying it was probably an impurity. Okay, last case. Um, so this is a 45-year-old man. He has a history of lumbar back pain due to a herniated disc, and he has a very remote history of intravenous drug use. And remote being like more than 15 years in the past, but um, he's prescribed oxycodone, acetaminophen, um, combo tablets. So they contain 10 milligrams of oxycodone per tablet um, three times a day. So there will be one final poll here, um, but in this case, the screening results, again, were presumptive positive for opiates and presumptive positive for oxycodone. And confirmatory um, results, it was confirmed positive for morphine um, at a fairly low concentration, oxycodone, um, and oxymorphone. So the question was, um, does the presence of morphine indicate that the patient used a non-prescribed medication? So. What do you think? Um, consistent with oxycodone only? Maybe consistent with oxycodone only? Um, not consistent or we're on the fence and we want more information? Give you a, a little bit more time to decide. Okay, results coming up. <laughs> okay, some people think our, it is consistent with oxycodone only. About half of the remaining people consistent with, might be consistent with oxycodone only, and then, you know, slightly over a third of us think it's not consistent. So the interpretation that um, we wrote in, in this particular case um, is that the uh, morphine is, is not a metabolite of oxycodone, nor is it um, a contaminant in the pharmaceutical preparation. And so we recommended that the doctors consider other sources, um, previous prescriptions. I mean, there's a lot of other sources. Um, could be borrowed from a friend or, you know, the three-a-day oxycodones aren't um, taking care of the pain. And so you went to morphine. You, you know, you can think of a number of different things to explain this. So um, in, this, in this particular case, we recommended that they look for another source of, of the morphine. So um, it's a little less tricky when you're looking at two drugs that are not metabolically interconverted or that are not um, pharmaceutical contaminants. So hopefully everybody is, and those inter interpretations make sense. And again, a lot of this depends on what the interpreter thinks and the clinical context. So it goes back to the doctor. So if you're doing interpretations um, and you want help, where can you go? Um, generally, I recommend that people contact the laboratory that performed the testing. So if a patient was tested at a hospital across town and they call me for help, um, it's really hard for me to help them because so much of this depends on the actual physical testing that is performed. What assays are you using? What are your cutoffs? Um, what's the cross reactivity of that screen, et cetera? So um, always contact the lab that actually did the testing. Um, and then the other thing I recommend is that people consult the literature. And Wikipedia is a great resource, and I'm not knocking it here, um, but generally the real published scientific literature is what I mean when I say that. So 
I'm showing two sources that I think are particularly helpful for laboratories that are doing clinical toxicology and are getting into the pain management. So um, the College of American Pathologists, one of the regulatory um, agencies, has a book on clinical toxicology testing that's got a lot of good information on interpretations and common pitfalls that you might see. So that's something to consider. Um, and then there's an article here um, by Alex Staitman and Rob Fitzgerald. And they've gone through the literature and they've um, put together a fairly comprehensive list of all the false positives that you might see for class-based immunoassays. And they have this broken out by the manufacturer of the assay and by drug. So I think that's a really good place and I, I will frequently look in that, um, in that particular publication to see whether or not something has been shown to cross-react. Because often what you will find is that the doctor will have already confronted the patient about some discrepant result um, and the patient will swear, no, no, um, I, didn't, I didn't take that. I took some other thing and the internet told me that it cross-reacts. Um, the internet is a wonderful resource, but um, it can make things more complicated when people are you know, reading interpretations that don't apply to the test that they were actually, their sample actually underwent. So, two, two sources. Um, all the literature that I've used for the talk today has been cited in the slide, but the full citations are here for your reference. So if you want to go download those papers, um, there they are. And I would like to thank you for um, hanging out this morning, and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Dr. Colby, for that informative presentation. It's time for Q&A, and if you have a question you'd like to ask Dr. Colby, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on the screen, and click the Send button. We will answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Okay, let's get started. Dr. Colby, our first question is, um, let's see. Her two different techniques are required for quantitative result reporting by regulation. Is one single definitive testing enough? So we actually don't perform definitive testing um, as a screen. We, we only do the confirmatory testing. And we perform semi-quantitative results. So I mean, we have numbers, but as I said, we don't we don't give those out. We just use them internally for interpretations when we need them. Um, I'm trying to think. I don't. I mean, traditionally, um, as, and in forensic situations, um, you want two techniques. And I don't know offhand whether you need only one. Um, whether you need two techniques to report a number. I, I'm not sure that. I don't know. I would have to check. So, um, yeah, I would have to check on that. But, but I think, I mean, the advantage of two techniques is that you're quite sure um, that the result you're reporting is accurate. So you could do two mass spectrometry techniques, but that seems a bit like overkill unless it, the result is particularly contentious. Um, so that would be that would be my short answer. Is that I don't know, but it seems. That seems unnecessary. It seems like going straight to the definitive testing would be um, would be the ideal approach. And that if you need two techniques, then and you're going to have to do mass spectrometry twice. Then you might as well go back to your screen with confirmation because then we report a number with only, or you could report a number with only one um, one mass spectrometry. What are the pitfalls of point-of-care urinary drug screening for pain management? Um, pitfalls of urinary drug screening as a whole um, can be, you know, the interpretations are challenging. And um, for results that are confirmed, um, sometimes there's a number of explanations and making sure that you give the provider all the information they need to 
make a decision or or if a decision can't be made if there's two equally viable explanations for how um, a pattern of metabolites might have been produced then i think making sure that you know you are um, you give them as much information as you can but not you can't overinterpret the results um, i think that's a challenge and then if this question was um, particularly about the um, point of care i think Point of care where the drug screening cups, where you have just an amino assay embedded in the cup or, or a test strip, um, I think those can work really well if you confirm the results. Um, those are subject to the same sorts of false positives um, and false negatives as the class-based screens that are run on main lab analyzers. Just a question of where those are performed. So some clinics find that more convenient because you have the patient there, so you have an immediate result. Um, that doesn't always tell you upfront whether or not it's consistent um, with what they're being prescribed. So again, confirmatory testing is still really important, even if you're doing point of care. Dr. Colby, can you tell whether someone is taking their medication as prescribed using a urine drug test? So taking it as prescribed, um, I'm assuming this means, you know, I'm prescribing oxycodone um, three times a day, and is the patient actually taking it three times a day? Or, you know, they're taking it three times a day. They say they're taking it three times a day, but they, you know, their pills got stolen, they ran out of pills, you know, something like that happened. I mean, we hear this a lot. And so there's a lot of reasons why a doctor might be, um, might not, be entirely comfortable with what the patient is telling them as, as far as what happened to their medication or why they're out early if they're doing a, um, you know, they're, they need more medication than or they're off their prescription schedule. So um, in these cases, I, I think it's really hard to use urine um, to determine compliance. I mean, we've talked about all the things that impact concentration in the urine, so I think it's not very straightforward to do that. So we don't, we don't say anything about whether they're compliant with the dose. And if they ask me, um, which they do often because they want that information, they want to know, they being providers, they want to know, um, I, I explain how hard um, that is and why, why generally speaking, um, it's not a good idea to determine dosing compliance from urine drug screening results. We have some great questions coming in, but we're almost out of time. This will have to be our last question. Dr. Colby, do you always report the quantitative drug measurements? We, we don't um, always report those. We, we tend to um, keep them internally, so we always measure a concentration, but what we report to providers is just qualitative, positive, or negative. We found that that gives them the majority of the information that they need, and when they need additional help or guidance with an interpretation, then we are more than happy to do that. So we, we keep it in channel. I would like to once again thank Dr. Jennifer Colby for her presentation. Dr. Colby, do you have any final comments for our audience? I don't, um, other than to say thank you all for your attention and for engaging in the polls, um, and hopefully uh, you learned something or had fun. Thank you again, Dr. Colby. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through February 2017. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. We thank you for joining us and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.